When the credits start rolling, but the movie keeps haunting you. Before, after. Then it's time to tune in to Dismembering Horror. We'll talk about what worked and also what didn't. We'll dissect every aspect. Maybe someone we shouldn't. He turned out to be a completely unreliable asshole. Take it away, boys. And hello, Tim. Hello, Ryan. And hello, everyone. Thanks for listening. And especially hello to We Are So Lucky, two two weeks in a row with guests here, two episodes in a row with guests here, and our first time ever having two guests on our show from uh, one of our sister shows in our podcast network, Connected Podcast, from the wonderful podcast, Rom Crime. I give you the wonderful Avrin and Vanya. Vanya and Avrin, hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having us. We're so very happy, happy to be, to be here. here. Great, great. Wow. In sync already. <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> Can you do the entire episode in unison? That'd be great. We'll do Absolutely. our best. Absolutely. <laughs> I think this will be a fun uh, episode to get uh, to get your dismemberment and joint insight on. And that film is Vampire's Kiss, starring none other than Nicolas Cage. Our third Nicolas Cage film we've done after Mom and Dad and Mandy. Oh, yeah. And uh, directed by Robert Bierman, written by Joseph Minion. So to introduce and get to know both of you, as well as your show, I had a question for just that. So your podcast, it combines romantic comedies and real world crimes, often murders, and finds a fun juxtaposition between the story of the romantic comedy and the real life, real life crime. So I would love to know from you two, what is it about that juxtaposition that you two love? So many things. I'll go first, Vaughn. I sure. think what it, what it does is it allows, I'm the one that finds the real world crimes to tie into the rom-com. And so it allows me just this kind of fun creative space where I have to really dig because there's so many well-known true crime stories out there. Uh, and it really does give me the chance to look for specific, like either like characteristics of the people in the movie that I feel, you know, might resemble a serial killer. Or in one instance, I actually found a crime that was inspired by the rom-com we were doing, which That's was right. Practical cool. Magic. So that was oh. a, that was a one and only that hasn't happened again. But I check every time now. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I like the challenge of having to find something that I can tie to a film. Totally, and I agree with that. Like we sort of we were doing just uh, like female inspired or or love inspired crimes in the beginning, and we kind of thought what could what could like you know, focus it a little bit more. And so, and I love rom-coms and I love, I love rom-droms. I love rom. And I'm always the, I'm like the one that is a little bit freaked out by the true crime. So it's kind of fun because I feel like I can really dive into something that is, you know, maybe not so real. And then when Avrin is giving us her crime, I'm just like, oh my God, how could that even happen? But it does. I love it. It's really fun. And every week is is exciting. I usually don't know what crime she's doing, so it's cool and uh, it's fun. Cool. And what kind of unique insight do you get from that juxtaposition? Well, I think, you know, interestingly enough, I do love rom-coms as well. I think they're super fun, but I also think we can all agree they're very problematic in many ways. <laughs> Yeah, And so a lot of that, you know, you find specific personality types that I'm like, I don't know if we should be celebrating this like stalkerish behavior. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> and so I feel like it's actually, there's, it's a fun way to just kind of point out, you know, some of the serious issues that exist within the world of the romantic comedy by referring to a real world crime story that you're like, see, this is the actual outcome of that behavior. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And I feel like both of these are escapes for people and in different ways. So, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Great. Yeah. We recommend it. Everyone check it out. Rum crime. Yay. All right. Anything else before the trailer? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Then. I think that one's ready. <laughs> so here we go. From 1989 Vampire's Kiss. How was your weekend? It's all right. You know. 
There's nothing to shattering. He was an ordinary guy. <laughs> Morning, everyone. Morning. Looking for an extraordinary love. I'm Peter Lev. Rachel. I brought this girl up to my place the other night. It started with a kiss. Really hot. A very special kiss. You wanted her very badly. Yeah. A kiss that could drive you mad. I hate interrupted love affairs, don't you? Yep, 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 yep. It's affecting his work. There you are! It's a horrible, horrible job. And you have to do it. It's ruining his appetite. My next appointment with you is uh, Tuesday afternoon. I'd like to make it sooner. It's spoiling his sleep. Sooner. And don't think people haven't noticed. Am I getting through to you? Over! He is so eccentric. My, my. For Peter Lowe. <laughs> All right. Peter Lowe. <laughs> oh my God. Peter Lowe. <laughs> so, 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 now we like to move into the rating section of our show. So, Avrin and Vanya, we would love to hear from each of you how you would rate this. As in, what would you tell your past selves who haven't seen this film in regards to this film? Would you tell yourselves to avoid, stream, rent, or buy Vampire's Kiss? And you can kind of summarize your experience and maybe overall opinion into leading into your answer here. I mean, I would I would definitely rent this one and maybe, I, this is crazy, I really enjoyed it. I mean, Avrin had to remind me, chatted a little bit before this, she had to remind me, you know, there's a little bit of misogyny and rape in there. I'm like, that's right. But I had such a fun time watching this. I like laughed hysterically. Some of the, as a former actor myself, some of the acting choices that Nicolas Cage like does is just bonkers and I love it so much. Um, so I read, I rate it as like, I would definitely rent, probably I'd end up renting it twice or something because I want to show, like my husband hasn't seen it yet and I'm I want to show, I'm like, you have to see this movie. <laughs> it is absolutely batshit crazy. <laughs> Good batshit crazy. I was like, we got to get that in there. Batshit <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and say I would buy this. Um, Whoa. I thought... It was 100% like bananas insane and like mad genius. And it also has that quality. Like, did you guys ever watch The Room? Oh, yeah. Oh, the yeah. Movie's so, I've been to a the movie's screenings. so bad. Yeah, I've been to several screenings too. I have a football signed by Tommy Wiseau. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like there's also kind of that quality to this. Like, it, it's so good that it might be bad and that's what makes it great. <laughs> I don't know, but I would buy it. I, I enjoyed Nicolas Cage's is so insanely amazing in every way in this movie. It's it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. <laughs> Great. <laughs> How about you, Tim? Wow. I had a very different experience, except for Nicolas Cage. Like, it, if it wasn't him, I would be a hard avoid. Whoa. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll be a stream for the sake of Nick Cage. Okay ekes it up to a stream for you. Uh, I had, I think, similar but different reaction uh, reaction as you two, where uh, it's a it's a buy for me. I just had so much fun with it, and there's something about the story, like a story that I don't know. It's near and dear to my heart is a weird way to put it, but just something about it. I love stories about the most horrible, reprehensible people going through some kind of fantastical situation beyond their understanding. You know, like Bill Murray and Scrooge, or even Groundhog Day, that kind of thing. But especially, yeah, with a fantastical element, with uh, with the macabre involved especially. So uh, ticked a lot of boxes for me there. And then... And then his performance, I mean, just through, through I just... Uh, also, with, with something I really look for in films is just, do I... Is something unexpected always happening? And that is like how I would describe his performance through and through. So 
that made up for, you know, the fact that we hate him and at least we had Alma to root for. I, I just thought it was great and kind of ahead of its time in a lot of ways. I'm excited to talk more about it in What Worked we'll get to. But before then, we have our summary, which we are hoping you two could tag team here. Just try to keep it. I wish we had the time for your full retelling. I love so much that you do (laughs) in your show. But uh, yeah, just a few minutes, just kind of like, what was this film? What happened in this film? Okay, so this film follows uh, literary agent Peter Lowe, who is like a lonely douche canoe uh, (laughs) going through some stuff. He's in therapy for sure. You know, he's trying to find love. He loves the ladies. He loves uh, the ladies. He goes a out lot. every night. He goes out every night, picks up a new woman. That's right. He and tortures his... his secretary. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, and then also, you know, the therapy is he's just trying to figure himself out, right? He's a guy looking for love. He's like, why do I want them to leave after I have sex with them in the morning? I was really in Why him. am I turned on by bats? You know, yeah. all those normal <laughs> questions. <laughs> And also a guy who loves to, like you said, torture his sweet, nice secretary that lives way out, I don't know, probably on the L train, the last stop or something. I don't know. I feel bad for that woman. And in the end, gets bitten by a sexy vampire lady and becomes a vampire. Mm -hmm. In his own brain. (laughs) Right. Or, yeah, he has a one. He has another one night stand, and he uh, he gets bitten by a woman during a, a sexual encounter, and becomes convinced that she is a vampire who has turned him into a vampire, and it just kind of Im- he kind of implodes on himself while also exploding all over all of us. It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, exactly. And that was everyone's read on it. That it's definitely no real vampirism involved. It's just. Absolutely, he's going crazy and (laughs) convinced Mm -hmm. he's a vampire. Yeah. Yeah, great, great, great. Cool. That was anything else to add to that? Hmm. Not really. Yeah. Well, do we? We're we're spoilers here, right? We spoil. Yeah. Yes, we consider everything a spoiler, including everything we said thus far. So, yeah. Great. So, in the end, he, his, after he rapes his secretary, her brother, Stabs him in the heart with a stake, <laughs> and that's the end of the movie, man. He was trying. He was trying to do it himself, and then the guy was like, "I guess I was gonna beat you with a crowbar, but now I'm just gonna shove the stake in for you." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a very isn't this convenient moment. Oh, that's yeah. great. <laughs> I think we can move on then and get into the bulk of our show here. That was perfect. The first big section: what worked. What worked. It worked like a charm, Smith. <laughs> well, I mean, I think we could, should we start real big? Like, what worked in this movie is Nicolas Cage. <laughs> if, like, yeah. in all, all of it. Like, there's nothing I can say that didn't work with him. Uh, it is, it's so outlandish. I was so, in, I was obsessed with his voice because at times it sounded kind of British and then at other times it sounded like Keanu Reeves from like Bill and Ted. And yeah. <laughs> it helped me kind of stay in this weird magic realistic world that he created. And you can really tell like as an actor, like he got himself into the a, a place where he was just like, there was no holds bar. There was nothing he meant off it. limits. Like he meant He meant it. everything he did. Yep. <laughs> it was yeah. so fantastic. So his voice worked for me. Oh, that's good. I have a theory. I I think that he's doing that era Donald Trump. There's a thing in the in the the ooh that is a very specific Mm. Donald Trump like vowel. And I think we, you know, it's we don't think of Don like our generation, I don't think, thinks of Donald Trump necessarily from that era as much now, right? Because we've experienced him now. But remember, in 89, Trump was like the quintessential New York, you know, rich yuppie. And this whole movie is about a yuppie, granted, a literary whatever. I don't, his job is his job. But so that's not necessarily connected. But still, I think my theory is that he was basing that affectation off of that era's Trump. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I have in our uh, for our things of note section what he did, what his intentions okay. were. I'll so share we'll them. find Ooh, out. I can't wait. But there is oh, a good. connection there that um, 
that is something that I have for what works. I just want to get out of the way while we're on the topic of Nick Cage and his performance here. Maybe this is more so on his character. But when I said, yeah, I love I love stories about reprehensible people in this sort of situation. There's something especially about like it's he's the New York quintessential just like gets the cushy job to abuse people like do coke whatever like it's just that in like Donald Trump it's like what he's the the figurehead for right right it's like that <laughs> like the the wolf of wall street gang basically i like just love that as a pitch just like take that person and put them into a situation where they think they're turning into a vampire and just cuz i think like that type of person embodies so much for me not just how like they're completely crazy like i think his performance and character just sort of spells out for us people like that they are not just completely crazy but also absolutely childish and just to see all that come out i think was so satisfying yeah he was uh you know because watching him over the years i remember when i was younger i had a friend who like thought he was really good looking when i was like in my 20s and i was like what? I was so gross. But the truth <laughs> is, when you look at him back then in the 80s, he's like a pretty good looking, suave dude, you know, who's not afraid to do ugly things. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> like even, okay, so in the, like to, to go to the rape scene, it wasn't even his idea to rape her, right? So, or in the script, right? So he, she's like, please don't rape me because that's what she thinks he's out to do and he's like oh yeah rape and he like does this tongue motion and go and I'm just like it's like how did he even honor his uh instincts to just do that crazy but I feel like yeah he did he he's he's amazing and a little uh disturbing to me which (laughs) which I think works for this absolutely I think that's a good way of describing his kind of acting technique like that is who he is he just is constantly honoring his instincts and not he's so uninhibited totally yeah. oh i'm jealous uh, of that no, i mean that's yeah, cool no right? inhibitions yeah at all yeah <laughs> and also uh, to throw back to the donald trump you know the the vocal affectation i feel like there's a little play with the hair happening too that might be a nod mm-hmm. to the trump <laughs> yeah. the poof like, the um, poof that like slowly starts to come apart yeah um, right. As far as uh, specific affectations that he did or little ticks that he brought to, like you mentioned. Oh, my God. Um, I think one of my favorites or yeah, I just have a couple. I just had to shout was um, it's like he's at his desk and the secretary calls and goes, Peter Frank Heatherton on line three. And like, you know, he he just in that moment, he's just so stressed out about it. And he shows it by doing this like jaw tick, like. Like he bites mm-hmm. the air three times before getting onto the phone. I was like, what is that? And then um, my other favorite little moment I wanted to shout out was um, when he's talking to the psychiatrist, psychologist, whatever, talking to her about the bat. And uh, she goes, yeah, a bat. And he goes, a bat. Holy shit. And he like <laughs> paints the picture of the bat in front of him on his holy shit. So good. And then, of course, his his voice overall joke that way he's a joke oh my, that's exactly yeah. what i'm talking about that like yeah. oh thing you're right because he said i'm peter low like the way he says yeah. his last name a lot yeah I, I i hear it now and now i can't unhear that yeah. which i like yeah. i like that <laughs> oh my gosh and i oh. forgot to mention the scene with the therapist where he's the filing scene i, I mm-hmm. like i could watch just that scene over and over again it's so hilarious and mm. ends with like saying just like saying well, you don't you don't even know what you know being a psychiatrist I can't do it but you know it's just such a brilliant I just feel like it's such a brilliant uh, moment to moment in that scene A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V and he's like entire alphabet Right well that's that's what I thought was such a brilliant example of like what I was saying, how those kinds of people, they're childish. It's like he's so disconnected from reality and just like how mistakes can be made. Totally. He's like, I this never, is his way of letting it I've out. I've never done that. And he like, yeah, so he actually, at, at times in the movie, he does stuff where he's like, boo hoo, boo hoo. Yeah. You know, instead of crying, he says boo hoo. <laughs> That's, mm-hmm. That's true. And it is, it's very like a kid play acting at, at you know, an emotion. Yeah. Um, 
Well, any other uh, favorite mo- Nick Cage moments? I mean, the scene where he is in his office screaming for Alva, his secretary, and then mm-hmm. she's like actively <laughs> ignoring him. I know, but she when she's actively ignoring him, and then he comes like tearing out of his office and jumps up on the desk, and he's oh, like, yeah. "There you are!" Right. And then proceeds, and then proceeds to chase her into the ladies' room. I mean, no wonder this woman is terrified and thinks the worst is going to happen because it does. But Jesus. I mean, he's also not pretending he's not going to do terrible things. But just yeah. the way he's like, "There you are." <laughs> I was like, oh yeah. my God, he's insane. The manic <laughs> goblin almost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I think it's the scene that's like either gift or just there's a meme of it where it's like the eyes wide open scene where he just doesn't <laughs> blink and is staring at her. There's the other, there's the mm-hmm. other famous standout one, I feel like. What was, what is it he said when he was on the couch after? Uh, you know, after he breaks up with Jackie or whatever, he he goes to Jackie like to or leaves her at the museum, and he says something like "fuck you too, sister." So I don't know what, it, but that oh, yeah. oh no, Where he goes because she leaves lounging. him a message that goes so you know, don't call me back, fuck you, and then he goes, "Yeah, we'll fuck you too." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he does say sister. <laughs> he says sister. Yeah, and so then stupid. to uh, to actually jump to things of no, I listened to the commentary and that was one of his favorite lines in the oh, movie. Oh, really? Like, in the commentary, <laughs> he's laughing at himself. It's funny. Yeah. <gasps> That's great. All right. So, well, rather than <laughs> going on, on about Nick Cage as much as I could, and he will come up again as he's in this course. whole thing. But any mm-hmm. other things about this film that you thought were interesting, worked for you, you want to highlight? I do. I have, so I have two things, but they're kind of like broader, I guess. Um... And I don't watch a lot of horror movies, but I, I, I have a lot of friends who love them a lot. And anyway, so this was like fun because it didn't feel so horror like where I was like hereditary scared or something like, you know what I mean? So it was like easier for me to, anyways, the setting, just being in New York, I loved how weird every time they were on the streets, the New York streets, um, like with the mime dancers and like that one where, <laughs> right, where he like rips the, um, like, What does he do? He rips like a long, sharp wood piece from like a pallet that's on the street and scares these people. I'm just like, this happens in New York. You know, I live, I don't know. Did you guys live in New York? We lived in New York for like 15 years. So it's, this shit happens, you know, there's crazy people everywhere. And so I just, I really love that. It felt, it felt kind of authentic, which is crazy, you know? Oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. They honored they honored the way how someone, like, especially towards the end, you know, when he's murdered the woman in the nightclub and he's, like, begging people on the street to kill him. Yeah. And, you know, he's covered in blood and he's hunched over and he's dragging the stake with him. And the amount of people that just walk by him and yeah. kind of glance, but that's it. There's not even a reaction. They glance like, okay, I, try, I, I, you know, I've clocked you. I will not let you do anything to me, but... Otherwise, this is totally normal. That was, right. that felt very like genuine New York City where it's yeah. like, there's crazy everywhere, man. My <laughs> uncle, when I told him that I was moving to New York, he and my dad both were like, look, there's just really one rule that you need to live by. Don't make eye contact. And I was <laughs> like, what do you mean? They're like, it's look, true. it's just the way you got to be. Like, they're going to be crazy people. And the second you make eye contact yeah. with them, they know they got you. And they'll, mm-hmm. they'll, like, engage. So just don't engage. I'm like, all right. When my mom came to visit us, like, the first time, she's so nice. She's a teacher, and she's, like, the sweetest lady. She was, like, making eye contact with everybody. I'm like, Mom, you have to stop. They're following <laughs> she's us. She's, like, saying, hi, how are you? Good morning to everybody you pass. <laughs> like, stop doing that. She's like, man, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> one on, Should I continue? I have one other thing that's different, though. It's sure. Just, it's Please. A, it's an, a change in subject. I am kind of obsessed with whoever did the Foley, like the Foley art artist on this. There, okay, because there's like two moments where Peter eats a cockroach and the sound of the crushing roach and the squishing, I was like, oh, I actually want to vomit now. But it was just amazingly like over the top. <laughs> like Vanya, did you know he actually ate a cockroach and shot it twice? No. You didn't know. That's so I don't feel Why like you didn't you know. Do? That's so gross, man. <laughs> that was really that was really him eating a cockroach. <laughs> and no. that's that's who Nick Cage is. <laughs> and uh, something that's they commitment. Did, yeah, something they didn't mention. Now that I'd be curious about. You mentioned the sound. I wonder how much was live audio of that, and how much was fully. Right. Oh actually. my god! I guess no. you're right. Or they would have just turned it up because it felt like it felt 
it felt extreme. And then the other one is when, you know, he makes his, like, when he ruins his, his apartment and he makes his own coffin. So he's, like, upended <laughs> or his couch. And him, like, pulling it over his body and pulling it, it's, like, this crazy, hilarious, it's, like, this yeah, coffin I creak. I love that. It made me happy. It was like these little details that made this movie for me. Um, you know, I don't really smoke a lot of weed, but I kind of feel like that would be a good, mm. you know, smoke a little and watch this movie because there's so many little um, Easter eggs, I feel like, in it. Yeah. And th- that's something cool that you mentioned about the the sound effects there because, re- yeah, you're right. They are there, but it's not like... They're not, it's not over the top. Like, it's not like the moment in the burbs when Tom Hanks is eating the sardines on crackers. That's oh super played God, up. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that's like, co- that's like comical uh, cartoon style. But right. this is just those little accentuations, which is so nice and kind of connects to something I wanted to, a, a point I had that worked is that tonally, I thought this film, yeah, just struck such a nice well, tone um, where. <laughs> Like he's so super, super crazy and is allowed to go 110% Nicolas Cage. And I think that works because the rest of the film and all the characters around him are grounded enough. Like it exists enough in reality. Like you have the cab driver at the beginning calling him crazy. The person at the office saying like, oh, he's just so eccentric. And I think (laughs) that really helps with like the in for this movie and to make the comedy work. Well, yeah, and he's got a ground, sure. you know, the girl that he's gone on a couple of dates with or seems to be continuing to engage with, she's grounded in reality too. She's like, dude, you're you're being a psycho. Like, fuck you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I'd be curious from you too, like, what did you think of his uh, his technique and his approach with women? Like, how did that make you, like, how did he strike you as a person with what his approach was? <laughs> Would you I mean, fall under the Nick Cage spell, the, the Peter Lowe spell? <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think I wouldn't. However, you know, I, I kind of loved the like, pickup scene that they laid out for in the film. You know, you're listening to, in a kind of really interesting way, all of the different conversations happening in the bars. So you're getting like snippets of this conversation and then you hear this. And all of the conversations were really, really lame. And, you know, like no one should be impressed with anyone. And so the <laughs> fact that he, you know, kind of sli- like slides up next to you and he's lighting a cigarette and he's kind of laughing and... I don't know. Maybe it would work within the context of that room. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like with Rachel, so Rachel's the girl that he thinks is the vampire. Mm -hmm. I feel like when he when he strikes up a conversation with her, he's actually pretty smooth. Like the way he kind of sits behind her and is like, did you get that? Or did you think that joke was funny? Right. You know, she's like, "Um, yeah, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and then he like slides in next to her and then they're back at his place. So. Uh. Having worked in a bar for 10 years in New York and when things get really busy and people are, I mean, it probably would work on a lot of ladies. And because, you know, people are out to bone. And I think he's definitely more of a going out to get some some V rather than make some love connections. I don't know. But I don't think it would work on me. I'd just be like, fuck off. (laughs) I mean, the minute he did the the Trump voice, I'd be like, you're going to have to walk away, sir. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hello. I definitely Hello. feel like I, you know, I worked in bars in New York as well. And in I even though this is how, how long ago is 1989, long enough that I, I'm like, man, that act, it's still kind of like that. Like <laughs> it's not that Absolutely. different. Like I even felt like I kind of recognized a lot of the places that he was coming in and out of. Same. And I'm like, God, ni- that was 1989 and it looks kind of the same. Like, not a whole lot has changed. That's weird to me. Yeah. I know. It's the, you remember that shop he went in to get his his uh, Dracula teeth or whatever? I'm pretty yeah. sure that, that's down in the village. Like, I, I yep. my husband used to work right across the street at the Grey Dog there when it was in the West Village. Um, but I was like, oh, I know that spot. <laughs> yeah. That's, New York is weird like that. That's just, it's just something so good about this dude. Like him buying the teeth. It's like there's actual Ugh. gags in this movie uh, that make like, it work so I well. Like it. you mentioned the, the the comic one, or sorry, the coffin one too. I'm trying to think yeah. any other examples that come to mind. It's like, I don't know. I, 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 mean, also, I, found I love like, Just his sorry. demeanor, his like his look, like his sunglasses, his like, yeah. the whole thing is just a, it's such a ridiculous depiction of a thing that is and was like a thing. It's like, it's 
absurd, but it's not that far from reality, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is such a yeah. weird line to to sort of walk along. Yeah, to toe like the the lady in the office is like, oh, he's so eccentric. I mean, so right. many things can be explained away with that sentence. You know, like yeah. she notices he's not normal, but you know, um, not well, anything know, to worry we about. Know so many of those people, dudes, that they 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 live off of their eccentric shittiness in a way Mm -hmm. and they get Mm -hmm. by like they like somehow manage to like excel and you're like how are you successful you suck right yeah so to so to see him go full crazy to the point where he's walking into a wall at the end (laughs) oh god i love that so much Um, also the fact that he's so concerned about money i'm like he's supposed to be the one that has the money like what does he say to Alma or Alva? He's like, I just spent $50 on you. You better find that contract. <laughs> right. And then, then the thing with the teeth, he's like, here's an expensive set of fake teeth. He's like, do you got anything cheaper? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I love right. that moment, too, when he, like, runs out of the store and he, like, rips the bag open and he sticks the really, you know, fake, plasticky, super white fangs and then crawls away on the sidewalk. <laughs> and you're just like, what is going on? Yeah. Um, well, Tim, Mr. Stream It, did you have anything uh, that did work for you aside from Nick Cage? Uh, Look, I'm not, I'm not against the movie. I just didn't like watching it. Like I didn't have a good experience. You know, I wasn't like, it just felt the things that worked didn't feel like they were sort of cohesively put together in a way that made me excited. So, for example, because well, I we do... We have a full set. What, no, I know. Well, I'm going to talk about what did work, but <laughs> I'll get to why it didn't work when we talk about what didn't work. Okay. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> if you think about it thematically, I think the concept is very brilliant, right? Like, the concept is this douche knuckle <laughs> is believing that he's turned into a vampire, right? Like, why is that even relevant? Like, because vampires suck the life out of everything, right? Like, he, the thing that he's turning into, we would, we would say, metaphorically, mm. is the thing that we complain about this type of person, right? Like, he's just, he sucks, and he's sucking the life out of everything, and nobody <clears throat> wants to be around him. And so to watch that character devolve into the the like the monster version the the mythical version of that metaphor is a genius concept like i think that's great it just never came together in a way that that i liked connecting his performance to the script to that theme so it's like it's there and I think maybe under different circumstances, I think if you were watching this in a group, uh, if you were smoking some weed, maybe I would have had a better experience. I don't know. But that idea I love. And like, who better than Nick Cage to, to <sighs> occupy that idea? It's, it's awesome. And I mean, the, the absurdity is so, so good. The, I, the, <laughs> the fact that yeah. he carries around his own stake <laughs> And it yeah. ultimately, it, it, like, happens into a situation where a guy's like, "Yeah, sure, I guess." Uh, since you asked, I, mm-hmm. I'll I'll jam this through you. Like, <laughs> all of that is it's it's really well constructed, but it just never quite felt right to me. Well, right, well, like even okay. even yeah. the belief, right, the belief that he is a vampire finally comes to him when he puts all of his gun in his mouth. And fires it, and that we know they're blanks from a scene earlier in the movie. But he thinks right. that he's, you know, oh, right. invincible because he just put a gun in his mouth, and it didn't kill him. <laughs> and so, yeah, there's Which, it is kind of very smart the way they construct this, like not devolution, but the way he kind of falls apart or like becomes the mythical actual vampire in the movie. Yeah, yeah, and it's all it's it's all to the same. It's the the, the proper construct of, um. What do you call that when you when you have us a belief and it's like it's confirmation bias within himself, right? Like he's sitting there being like, I'm a vampire. And then things happen that he can then validate that idea through. 
but he is also wrong, right? Like he's dumb and ill-informed mm-hmm. and, you know, he's arrogant and narcissistic. Like it's such a great depiction of narcissism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yet, like, yeah. So I think all those things are great. They're working really well in in maybe in the abstract. I don't know. Great. Did that uh any of that spur anything else for you too? Just um what didn't work is I'm thinking about it now. So Okay. I see it. planted I for then. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but as far I as what I love Jackie's did, fashion. I love Jackie's fashion in the movie. Oh, I yes. was into all of her hats. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, we should bring all of these looks back. <laughs> They're great. Um last kind of big thing I had here was uh the ending i just i don't know it was just gave me enough of like a kind of pathos that you do want from an ending in a movie just kind of make you go oh it it kind of was about something in the end so just him fantasizing and hearing in his head the voice dream of me my angel dream of me and then it was really interesting how they played that sort of as the credits started rolling like 20 seconds in too but that's just that's just for me it just spoke to how someone in like the real life people he's he's kind of replicating in this and in this character they're just so like far disconnected from any kind of well genuine connection really like so it's just kind of fascinating to to think like what in their mind what in his mind is like emblematic of in this sense sort of like the angelic feminine connection to source is my kind of like mm. projecting read on it. I don't know how else to put it, but just that, you know, that little, little bit of him, like if this is his, if his character is a manifestation of a, a bratty, horrible, childish child, what is the innocent, ch- you know, that's a cover up for the innocent child. And it felt mm. like it was just nice that not till the ending, did we have something kind of speak to that, you know, that somewhere in his moment of death, maybe there is a person in there. Wow, that's really good. I like that. Um, well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what worked then? Uh, yeah, any last things for either of you? I mean, I could keep going on about moments with Nicolas Cage, but I think we've already established yeah. that he worked. Okay, <laughs> cool. How about uh, one, one last one to see us out? Well, I was just thinking that great moment at the end where he's, talking to his therapist about how he's finally discovered what he needs is love and a serious relationship and no more one night stands and he's standing up on like the windowsill above the couch (laughs) and she's like oh my god well ha 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 and she starts laughing you know and she's like the girl who comes in after you is looking for the same thing I could have saved you so much money and just and then they keep going back and forth and he's actually talking to like I don't know some concrete thing on the sidewalk (laughs) and I, I had this moment where I was like oh my God, were any of those therapy scenes real? Right, I thought the same. I was like, oh wait. You know, because I was like, is it the whole thing a fantasy? I think obviously we see the scene where he calls her at home and she's a real person and she's like trying to work him into her schedule. But I that moment where I was like, wow, he recovered from that place he was at. I thought the same thing too. And then he didn't. And you realize the whole movie they've been showing us that he has delusions and he sees things. Uh, But it didn't really like stick with me until all of a sudden I was like, oh, he's not talking to a shrink. He's talking to a wall. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm I'm glad you actually mentioned something that was uh, the scene with the psychiatrist psychologist because uh, we didn't mention anything about that. I, and I always enjoyed those through lines where sometimes kind of a through lines like that that are all the same location with the same character. They can feel like the movie drags a little here, but I enjoyed and looked forward to each one of those. And um, she was great. So great, great. I was also like, he really goes to therapy a lot. Like, Every day, it almost seems like. So maybe some of them were real and some of them were in his mind. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, I love when he's trying to get the earlier appointment. And yeah. like, sooner. Which is with the teeth. Just so <laughs> <Yeah>. pathetic. <laughs> yeah. I was just thinking about how much I loved that there were no cell phones in this. And mm. that... Um, you know, they had to use pay phones or going. He went into a building to use a phone. I was just like, oh man, that that is just not what what it is now. It was interesting to us. It yeah, was almost and like Jackie watching had history. to go to his house to leave the note that said like, "Stay the fuck out of my yeah. life." Right. She had to hand deliver that message instead of text it. Uh, <laughs> actually, yeah, nostalgia. from the 
for, yeah, from the rom uh, com, I keep on saying wrong crap. From the rom com perspective, there is that. I mean, with all film though, there's that clean divide of pre and post cell phone, internet, and all that. And totally. yeah, I don't know. It's like we're finding new ways of romance in uh, this age, but there's something that maybe feels the nostalgic kind of romance for sure that was yeah. depicted in this film. It was cool. Yeah. Okay, then, if that is it for what worked what worked <laughs> we can move on next section what did not work it's not ready yet seems to work okay no something important's missing what did not work <laughs> i think the biggest thing overall is how structurally i felt disconnected from what was going on. And so, okay, so uh, essentially we our construct is, or our structure is, meet the guy, see his lifestyle. He presumably gets bitten by a bat or a woman who is a vampire, and he starts to turn into a vampire only to find that, only to get to basically the, I guess the end of the second act would be him killing the woman at the party. And so that's sort of your, you know, bottom of the whatever. And then the third act is just a, a, a just him being mad. And I suppose it would be his interaction of me, seeing Rachel in the club right after would be sort of the, the I guess the beginning of the third act realization of like, oh, his world, we, we learn... And he learns, but denies, that all of this is in his head. And, and then it, you know, and then we have sort of a finale. To me, the biggest thing that I guess just I couldn't get on board with was that I never felt like the story itself was moving forward until he killed the woman at the party. It felt like him essentially doing the same scene or like having the same, you know, desires over and over again. Maybe that's the point in a way that the writing is is supposed to say, like he's he's in this monotonous world and he's sort of we're watching him fall apart in that monotony, trying to get the contract over and over and over and over again I get it, but I was so bored with that lack of like, in a way, lack of obstacles for him. And I think that to me was the big thing. I just was like, yeah, it's great watching Nick Cage be Nick Cage and be nuts and like terrorize his secretary. But there was no, to me, no pun intended, no stakes for him Mm. as a character (laughs) until we find out that this is all in his head. Yeah. He's, his job isn't on the line. There's like no like no resistance to any of this. And yeah. so I just was like, I don't care. I don't, like, I get what they're trying to do, but it's not honing in on a thing that makes me want to, like, stay invested, I guess. Right. No, Averin, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you're definitely right about that because – you know, I guess the crux of the conflict between the secretary, Alva, and him is that she can't find this contract, right? But we actually find out pretty early on in the film that the person who requested it doesn't actually care that much about getting it. And so all we really learn in that moment is that he is just a freaking asshole. Yeah, you know? And right. he's like, he's already been so like hard on her about it. And he can't let that go now knowing that it's actually not urgent or not important. But then also they keep, you're right. They hit that over and over and over again. And then she finds it and there's no, that doesn't matter at all. And so it's like, wow, we spent a long time torturing this woman to find this specific piece of paper. And then she finally finds it. And there's, that doesn't matter at all. (laughs) I was like, okay. And then, you know, I guess it does lead to a violent encounter, but I can see what you're saying. I'm trying to think of like what didn't work other than obviously as a woman watching this movie, there are certain elements to this character's, you know, clear hatred of women that can feel, you know, a little bit like, 
well, not a little, incredibly offensive, but I also kind of recognize <laughs> that it's meant to be absurd. So right. I was able to still, you know, kind of get beyond if I were to literally be like, this is a, a movie where I we watch like the protagonist, if you will, rape a woman, murder a woman, be completely cruel and say horrible, lewd, terrible things to all women. Um, and so the fact that I can walk away and be like, I would totally buy that movie. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm having a hard time like expressing what didn't work, even though there was a lot there that, you know, I did find, you know, disturbing in the moment. But like, I, you know, I, I think, and I think I give credit to the movie in that respect that I think that is the point of the movie that these people in our world like literally like Lottie fucking da through life unobstructed and get away with it so yeah. much. And that That's like, so thematically I'm like, this is a horror film. That is like, like the real life for real. And it's horrible. Like remember after he chases her, through the office and then there's like a board meeting and they're all laughing about it. Yeah, like, that was to give her a raise now, man, because you chased her into the ladies' oh room God. and threatened her. And but no consequences for him, you know. I, yeah. That was yeah. on my list right there. That's but scene... I, that is the point of the movie. I think you're right. Is like there's yeah. a, a certain type of you know person, and that's who you know Peter Liu is. Yeah. And how they do, they just waltz through life literally doing whatever they want and there are no real consequences except for what's inside his own mind. Yeah. Tim, and I agree with you. Street justice, right? <laughs> and then street justice. Thank God for the street justice. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Finally. <laughs> I had a problem with the way the wit and rip women were written a little bit. You know, it's like, and I think like we were talking, it is was probably purposeful. But like even even the scene, and I know it was probably just to have uh, her in a bra, but like nobody would be ironing in a bra with the with the sh shades open. You know, like it's just, when sh you know she's home, Alva's home. That annoyed me. I thought that was absolutely stupid. Right, that was the movie's moment to be like, she's actually totally hot. Yeah, right. I guess that was like the sole purpose of that. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> was like okay. So for me, that really, I think, is where I'm, like, leading from in my distaste is that you have an opportunity to keep all of these themes, and I get it, it's of its time, but, like, if we were making this movie today, who would be the main character of this movie? Not fucking Peter Lowe. Mm -mm. No right. way. I would, right. I mean, I would make this movie way more in the, in the same sort of way that build the narrative through Alva in the way that Mad Men built it through um, Elizabeth Mo uh, Elizabeth, wait, what's her last name? Moss. Elizabeth Moss. Moss, yeah. Yeah, through her character, right? We immediately understand the world that she lives in through her eyes, through her, you know, trials. But the story is ultimately about Don Draper. But like, if you set us up to to watch who Don Draper is through her eyes, so in this case, watch Peter Lowe through her eyes, I think that you can get away with a lot. And you can do double narrative. Like, you can have, we can see his life too. Like, that, that's not a problem for me. You can make that movie. But, like, to reduce this character to this sort of cliched, secondary, you know, buttoned up, like, frumpy whatever all of the dumb you know adjectives that you would see in the breakdown when it's like oh right. yeah mid you know mid 30s secretary must look homely and but but secretly be hot or whatever the thing would say <laughs> right. mm -hmm. you know like i just yeah. i i i'm so tired of all of that that when i see it i think there's a part of my brain that goes ugh, i yeah. don't even want to watch this or and why wouldn't she quit <laughs> right right i mean well, her there mother are, says you need the money. You can't. Yeah, I guess like, we can. All, yeah, it's, that seems I'm, late, like lazy writing. Yeah, right, exactly. like flesh her out. Then explain her to us better, because yeah. otherwise, just quit. I mean, know? he's terrifying, right. and he's really torturing. He really her. is. It's not fair. Yeah, what that do she we would know have to quit? about her at all? I mean, really just, at all? We don't. Right. She, we don't know what her. She lives with her mom. I guess that's it. She lives with her mom and her brother. With both of her which, parents. Honestly. Yeah. Just seemed like kind of a a reductive stereotype of like non white people who who right. have low level jobs in New York. It's like oh well, they don't have enough money to like have their own place anyway. So, but that's it. Like that's not that's not yeah. character. That's cliche or or worse, right? 
Yeah. So mm-hmm. let's know, like, what is her issue? Like, is she about to be kicked out? Is does she have? Is you know, like, does she have an, a a, a shitty ex boyfriend or husband or whatever? Like, what is her life? We don't. We just don't right. get that. All we know is that her boss sucks. Yeah, and tortures her openly, and nobody does anything about it. Yeah, I will say my yeah. favorite woman in in the show is the the old lady in the bathroom. She's like, "What the fuck is going on here?" And she <laughs> just right. washes her hands, and then she <laughs> says it again, and she leaves. I'm like, "I get you, I get you, girl. <laughs> get behind <Yeah>. your <laughs> amazing moment." Um, I uh, I feel that I get you, Tim. Yes, I agree. But just the fact that it was Maria Conchita Alonso, who I've always loved since The Running Man, yeah. it just at least had that pre-existing empathy and like full personage sure. there for me just as an actor. So that luckily was able to do some lifting to compensate for me for what you're saying. But just real quick on the story stuff that you were saying, I thought was interesting because I was trying to think you know, why I, I agreed with you what you were saying about maybe like, Uh, raising of stakes along the way Mm. but that didn't affect me or bother my enjoyment so is like like how you said this character it's so important for him like that he's never uh uh faces any impediments like so i wouldn't necessarily want that kind of you know like his job is being threatened or not so for me i just like the idea that it is which you know horror movies do a lot it's just like there's a rise of just crazier, 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 crazier. And that there was always an undercurrent and sort of evolution to that from scene to scene, If it, even if there weren't the obvious sort of more like immediate goals or what's the next step. So I think, yeah, that's just- I'm okay with it. And, and like in a different script, I think you need your protagonist to have hurdles, right? But I'm okay with it in this script if- we get to see Alva look around and go, is nobody going to do anything <laughs> about this? Like, we don't get to see her be us and point out that this motherfucker yeah. can do whatever he wants and nobody seems to care. In fact, he's getting cheered along and, like, given raises or, like, pats on the back or whatever. Like, I think we need that touchstone and we just never really get it, which sort of speaks to the inherent misogyny in that the script may be trying to point at, but falls prey to it as well at the same time, which is weird. <laughs> yeah, it's like they're trying to point out. I mean, we're meant to know this person's awful, right? He's openly <laughs> horrible. So as the right. audience, we're like, this guy's not just crazy, but horrible. But you're right, because we never get that moment where somebody outside of Peter is like, uh, this isn't cool. Is anybody going to even comment on this other than in the privacy of their own home to a mom who doesn't want to listen to them? Because, you know, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like someone needed to, she needed to have her moment. Yeah. And she, even in the end, she doesn't do the street justice. You know, it's not her that gets to. That's right, which is a huge thing that that bothers me in film. Yeah, she should have gotten to plunge that stake in, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm so like, I, I, this is my complaint with Rogue One, even though I know everybody seems to like Rogue One. <laughs> the main character is told to not be able to exact her righteous revenge. Like, don't do it. It's not worth it. That mu- that, and, and have like a dude telling a woman that she doesn't get to have that moment is so like infuriating to me that that still gets written. So to see it in this, it's like I agree. It's just it's it like bums me out. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. don't we want to see her be the one be like finally exact some revenge for all the awful things that this dude has done to her? Absolutely. Right. Like, even if they would have just gone in together, right? Like, brother's got yeah. the crowbar, but she's by his side. Like, this is what happens when you mess with me. And then she's able because he basically puts the stake on his own body, and he's like, "Do it," you yeah. know. But How then awesome. she gets to shove it in. That yeah. would have been better. It- that it would have been, been so cool to have the moment of her, bro- like, they're both standing there with Peter Lowe being, you know, being like, just do it or whatever. And the brother being, like, about to swing down. And right as he raises his hand, she slams it home. Yeah. As, like, sort of its own jump scare. We go, oh, Ooh, man. Right. 
Like that would be so cathartic. And yeah. I think yes. maybe that's mm-hmm. also part of what's missing for me is that there is, because we don't have the, this touchstone, there is no catharsis in the movie for mm-hmm. me. It's like sim- right. It's like almost sympathy for Peter Lowe is like ha- at the end. Like what you were saying, Ryan, like it's built in there to, and I get it. It's like, it's pointing from a different angle. So that that's fine. That was, if that was their intention, I get where they're coming from. But like for me, the viewer and the movies that I want to be watching and like excited about, I want revenge, catharsis, like justice, like all those things, especially in the world right now. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. It's, I, I, I like, maybe this is, I don't know. It's just who I am, whether it's a good or bad thing. I don't know. But I liked that there wasn't a like, revenge moment of catharsis like as horrible as he is like that is fun in movie terms but I just thought it was really interesting to have it where it was almost like there was like maybe like the brother the whole time is hesitant about going in and actually killing him and she's like he's like at one point are you sure you want real bullets here and you know she convinces him (laughs) so the fact that the murder the killing at the end it is like plays out where he's just kind of going in to maybe kill him maybe rough him up we don't really know whatever and then it's just kind of like a he almost just sort of pushes the situation along i don't know i just i I appreciate something that isn't just violent revenge catharsis, whether it would from her or not. I and I don't think it's. I think it's true to the movie, because again, Peter Lowe gets his way. Right. Oh, he like wants that, it. He's been right. wandering the streets begging people to kill him. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, really, like when the brother does it, he's you know he's helping him out because he yeah. can't from that angle do it. <laughs> So actually, <laughs> actually, that could have been fun if it was her, but it wasn't. Yeah, at least for me, I wouldn't have liked that. That just she just kind of does it. But if there was still like the hesitation and just like mm-hmm. in the the scene underneath in the building, she he like goads her into it or something. That would be pretty interesting. Yeah, where Sorry, she's like, okay, fine, Peter, I'll help you do this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Well, I I had a question about because I couldn't tell if it, if I thought it worked or not. The scene where he goes into the mirror, he's becoming the vampire, right? In his mind or whatever. And we we don't see his POV. We see just uh, audience POV of him looking in the mirror and he's there. Do you think that worked? Or, I mean, it kind of tickled me a little, but I was like, I, I can't tell if I don't like this or if I if I do like this. Is that I the scene like, in the bathroom? Yeah, where he's like, okay. what was, what is he saying? He's like, where am I? Oh, or vampire. something like. Yeah. I feel like that was the first real moment where the the story is is tipping its hand and saying, actually, all these little potential Mister X that or not Mister X these potential clues that he's just in his head. That one was the one where I was like, he really is just imagining all this shit. Mm-hmm. Like he's just going crazy. So in this in the sense of working. For the story, I think it worked. Mm. I don't know if it necessarily works as a scene, like in the moment, but it may be. The guy in the bathroom, the the guy taking a shit in the bathroom is kind of funny. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, dude. Yeah. I just curious because I was like, but it does make sense because it is the first time that we kind of get the inkling that he's, it's in his head. There's like maybe what two, maybe three clues prior to that where he's behaving in his apartment and we see that Rachel is not there and he's like talking to nobody, yeah, which works, yeah. I think, which is a smart misdirect or, or whatever you want to call yeah. it, that we think, oh, there is some supernatural thing going on that she's become invisible. But it, I think that one is a smart one mm-hmm. like that. That made sense to me. The reveal is is great that she's like, get out of here, dude. I like I met you one time. Yeah. yeah. She was right. like, We hooked up that one time. Like, please get your hands off me. You know? <laughs> and she doesn't have fangs. <laughs> right. If that's it, which it sounds like it is, for what did not work, we can move to our last big section here. Things of note. This should be interesting. I was shocked that this movie was 
came right after Nicolas Cage did Moonstruck. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's kind of a, I mean, I've never heard of this movie before we talked, you emailed us, <laughs> you know? I don't know why, I just had never heard of Vampire's Kiss. So I was like, how did he do Moonstruck? And then this, I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the filmmakers, I, I have a literal answer for you. Um, oh, good. The filmmakers <laughs> reached out to him about doing it, and but his agents or his managers, whoever, were like um, advising him, no, you shouldn't do that, you know, after Moonstruck. Uh, you don't want to do this. Well, it's kind of a weird movie. It's a horror movie. Don't do it. But uh, he he just decided, you know what? I want to do this. He felt like because it was different from Moonstruck that that's what interested him about it. So that's how it worked out. Right, and that it would let him explore the mm-hmm. specific type of acting that he, you know, there would be no big budget film that was going to let him experiment in this way. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he sure did. Yeah. And he, sh- <laughs> he sure did. And it was awesome. Um, well, yeah. Did, did you two have anything else? Or I can kind of go down my list of stuff I learned from the commentary track. Well, I already blew it with mentioning that he really ate the cockroach. That's so. the <laughs> Got it. That's the okay. Well, to, to, yeah continue on um, kind of what you were just pointing out about his performance. And yeah, that could have been a reason for him wanting to do that. Some fun details on his performance. Well, he says it's one of my favorite performances. So it's near and dear to the man himself. Well, you do know that Nicolas Cage is a goth. He's a self-proclaimed goth (laughs) recently. (laughs) Oh, I didn't know that. (gasps) I did not know that, but that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) Yeah. He said, I'm a goth. So on his voice... He says that in some ways it's like his father who is a professor of comparative literature who like he could tell was actively choosing to speak with distinction and sort of with this uh, continental sound is how he described the kind of voice Mm. or accent as continental. So for him, it was almost like in a way that Peter was this is just the mode that he slips into. This is the voice he speaks with because he's supposed to sound officious and important. That was his take on it. Um, And then as far as, uh, yeah, more on his performance, he explained was he, he wanted to do the whole performance in, in homage to not uh, Bela Gossi's, Dracula, but like plays in the film, the old Nosferatu movie, Max Schreck. So that was down to just the over the topness of it all. Like that's what he was going for. Like he was going for literal, uh, yeah, silent film acting style yes, to that you extreme. You can see that like when he does, like the way he w- makes his eyes so big, like if that yeah. scene had no, you know, there would be just music behind that and no actual dialogue that would, mm-hmm. that could have just been right out of like, an, you know, an an old fashioned like silent film. (laughs) Right. And that scene specifically, he says his whole goal was just to make his eyes as wide as possible. (laughs) Success. (laughs) Right. And then, um, but that's great. You see the Nosferatu-ness also in the way you mentioned, like he's carrying his shoulders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's his sort of upper. Exactly. Yeah. That's the Mm -hmm. way he's, he's doing that walking like his Nosferatu hunch. Um, so it was funny. He admits that at the time, especially, he's more about all his method acting. So he was uh, insisting at the time that the bat at the beginning was real. And he was like flipping out that they wanted to use the fake bat that they used, which <laughs> I thought was fun. <laughs> Looked great. But um, like he was like, you know, going back and forth the director, you know, his tensions in the crew. He said he was like sending someone to Central Park to find a bat. And then what? finally, the director sounded really good in his uh, kind of playing um, babysitter. I don't know, just being that, I don't know, director job. Um, he told him that, well, you know, Nick, if you're bit, you might die. So then that Nick Cage backed off then. It's good. good <laughs> and then strategy. this movie will never get finished. <laughs> yeah. Um, Rabies are real, Nick yeah. Cage. Right. Rabies are real. <laughs> Uh, In his own words, this was a story of a man whose loneliness and inability to find love literally drives him insane. Mm. Okay. That's a rom-com way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, I don't know if you have this, but I'm seeing here that it says that the writer wrote the screenplay as a response to his in quotes, toxic relationship with his then girlfriend. Mm. Oh. I know that. How would that? So what he thought, did he think of his 
then girlfriend as like a vampire who I destroyed don't, him. I don't. It doesn't go into death. In depth <laughs> to it just says uh, deal de- dealing with themes of isolation, loneliness, and domination. Yeah. Oh. Maybe he just uh, realized the Peter Lowe in him and had to exercise him. Mm. Mm. It was the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, it was funny just to hear. You know, we mentioned how great the uh, the alphabet counting scene was, and it was interesting <laughs> to hear. Because like like so much of his performance is is just this of the moment going with the instinct, embracing these little eccentricities. But he said that for that one specifically, he did rehearse all those hand emotions for that that set speech, whatever you want to call it. And he wow. is great because he said all hand the hand emotions during the alphabet counting they're figured out in his hotel room with his cat Lewis. <laughs> So his cat helped him rehearse that one. So he choreographed that moment then. <laughs> yeah. It was choreographed, yeah. <laughs> That's why it's so it's so good. <laughs> yeah. oh, so um, good. And then more on a, just kind of, this was another funny example of something that he, an idea he had, and then the director had to find a tactful way to say no. Nick Cage, he really wanted and like showed up with a just drawn on pencil mustache. <laughs> and he's like, so this is how I think my character should be the whole movie. You know, he should have this mustache. Oh, and, my um, God. Amazing. Yeah. I forgot what I he said. I love that it seems it was clearly an exercise in, like, the absurd of it all. You know, like, yeah. how how far will you let me take this in terms of, you know, just completely absurd. Yeah. And he said, um, like, when the, the whole crew kind of, like, looked around, like, how's the director <laughs> going to tell him, him no? And uh, I... Don't get exactly how he made it work, but he said something about how that would interfere with the the teeth, the fake teeth gag, or make that not work somehow. <laughs> and Nick Cage was like, "Oh, you're right." And then, um, last little tidbit that I thought was fun: the um, apartment destroying scene, the freak out we kind of mentioned earlier. That was just it was part of you know low budget film, and they were just crazy and young. And it's kind of interesting actually here throughout this film, like it's you know feels like it's a big studio movie, whatever, whatever. But it's actually super low budget. Um, so none of that stuff was like they were no breakaway props or anything in that apartment. Like that's right. all like a real mirror he's breaking. Everything in the apartment oh. he's breaking is real and was apt uh, to injure him. But uh, he said it lent in authenticity, so he loved it, it informed his acting, and then reflecting back in this commentary, he said, "Yeah, I was off my, I was off my rocker." <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that scene because I do remember that initial scene where he first comes into his apartment with Jackie before the bat comes for him. All mm-hmm. I kept thinking as they were kind of violently hooking up, you know, he's like ripping his clothes off and she's tripping around. I was like, someone's yeah. going to fall on that glass table. That's all <laughs> yeah. I kept thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and um, great. Last little tidbit I had. This was more fun thing for our show, Tim. Connection to Larry Cohen, director oh. of The Stuff. His daughter played the woman who Peter Lowe kills in the club. Wow. Oh. Here we go. Very That's interesting. <laughs> it's funny for like the only thing I really have about this is is super anecdotal but when I was in New York taking acting classes that his performance in this was referenced often. I mean maybe it was just because like my my teachers uh, were contemporaries of him or something like that but there was like lore about the period of time when he was working on this film and that he would be seen run like running around de- New York City doing crazy shit, and pe- and like got almost got arrested a couple times because people were like, "Who is this nut?" Who's like, "There's some story about him t- like taking a like a remote control car or something and like driving it into the middle of like Ninth Avenue and then running out there and like stomping on it in traffic and just being generally completely insane." Now, whether or not any of that's true, I don't know. But those are like the stories that kept getting imparted to us in our classes. So I think maybe just as a tool to be like, you can be nuts, like get crazy and like go as big as you possibly can. Yeah. See where that takes you and then rein it in from there. Right. Interesting. <laughs> I love that they yeah, were I lived that. off Ninth Avenue. So that would have been so did yeah, I. highly distressing. To see. <laughs> <laughs> you did. I was on 47th and 9th. 
Get out. I was, well, I actually lived one uh, for two years on 48th and 9th, and then also on 49th and 9th for two years. Wow. We were neighbors. <laughs> Also, oh, that's why you look familiar. <laughs> there you go. We just passed each other on the street all the time. Yeah. Also <laughs> foreign to me. Actually, yeah, for all you New Yorkers, that uh, fun tidbit they did mention was the approach for filming it or the director really wanted New York to always be in the background and informing something about him. It was like they always wanted him to like in the shots where he's in the office psychologist, like it's it's, it's, yeah. he's framed so it's in the background again speaking to the low budget too like if someone is looking at him like he's a crazy person on the street that is an actual person doing that they're like <laughs> that's i don't know you pe- people have so he different- really was just terrorizing like new yorkers they were yep. like oh cross the street exactly exactly Amazing. that's crazy <laughs> Yeah, because those people, the two people, the couple or whatever, they look terrified. And they do what, <laughs> yeah. it feels real. I was like, yeah, I have had moments where like a crazy person comes out and you just kind of do the uh, ignoring thing. And then, but they get too close and you're like j- jumping out of the way. So that was real. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. Uh, I'd be curious just to, uh, to ask you guys, since you're all here, what is your your stance on that of like, filming people who don't know they're in a movie? Like, let's say in this example, like, well, what do you think of that? I don't think it's cool. I mean, you know, I feel like you got people need to give permission. It's a and also, you know, hire goddamn extras. Let them get paid. I'm big on letting people work. Yeah. Yeah. Ditto. Please. I mean, I understand the authenticity hire some, that you get. I mean, would I get. do. I, yeah. But I, I mean, you can get hire those people on the street. Be like, can we give you 50 bucks yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> to be in our movie? Mm-hmm. We're not going to tell you what's going to happen to you. But will you be in our movie? Mm-hmm. I think. What about you fair. guys? Yeah, it's it's something I wrestle with because it's like you kind of if you start from the approach of like documentary, which I feel like there is almost a sort of you're capturing something authentically. It's borderline news related. It's not like you're capturing their soul or whatever for like something they didn't consent to. Even though you know documentary, you do edit it, and it's not a reflection of the reality. There's the super indie spirit in me that like because there's so many real life examples of you know the hey we're i am walking here you hear of i think i get excited <laughs> yeah. about it but yeah. um it's it's something i wrestle with and i acknowledge in here like it'll happen with me and my dp shooting something where like someone walks by and maybe their head isn't in the shot but i'm like oh perfect yeah you know they just crossed frame and that worked out with that timing and he's very much on the spectrum, like, no, like, I, I cut then. I don't want, you know, it's not cool. So I think I'm kind of at the level where it's like, uh, yeah, you suggested where, yeah, I'd love to get those people, but toss them 50 bucks and get their okay. That's my kind of compromise I'm at right now. Yeah, I mean, as a filmmaker, from a filmmaking perspective, I agree, like, what you said. It's like, you're making a product, you're making a thing that's going to be out there for consumption. You should be asking permission. You should be hiring people to do to to fulfill the dream of the film. But on the other side of the spectrum, I'm all I'm become more and more curious about street photography. Something like I just really like it and find it interesting. And I'm like, and I've started to do it. And I'm like, I feel weird doing this. I'm like taking pictures of strangers. And like <laughs> it's for a purpose and it's not for monetary i'm like i'm not trying to make money off it i'm just i'm doing it for the quote-unquote art of it but i still feel very strange doing it so i think that if you're gonna do it i think it's best to like sure maybe get the picture but then go and be like is this cool like here it is here's the picture i just took of you are you cool with me doing that do you want me to delete it maybe that's the way to go i don't know i think people's you know privacy should be at least acknowledged yeah. For sure, yeah. Give people the option. Most people, me, I feel like most people want to. And then there's the things where when you're in New York or wherever and there's a sign and it's like, if you walk in this zone, you are giving consent to being in this movie. So at least there's you <laughs> yeah. know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Too. That really happens a lot. Um, cool, yeah. It's just been on my mind and since this, like, learning about it was a primo example of just <laughs> anything goes at me thinking about it again. Great. Any last uh, questions, things of interest from anyone for Vampire's Kiss? Okay, so I had a thought. I was like, how, if this was remade into a rom-com today, like, what would be the, you know, 
impetus or whatever. And my mind is this, because I had a lot of friends who were dating when we all lived in New York. And the guys would just, nobody would commit because there's always a better, like you could just scroll or swipe to another better fish in the sea kind of thing. And I have this, like, I had this theory that men just... In, in New York, because there's, what, like five women to every one man. So they, and honestly, <laughs> we talk about a ten, a, a 10 in New York is like, what no, like a, whatever. If you're in a small town, it's like you could be a 10, but you're actually a three in New York. Anyway, so my thought is, you know, it's a guy who let the, let the right one go. And it's similar. Like he does implode, but like it's because he didn't, he, he, he kept looking for the better thing. The next best thing. Mm. And I guess in the end, he doesn't die. Maybe he gets together with a secretary. I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> no, just kidding. Never. Uh, no, but I just was like, I want to think about that aspect of it. So I definitely, thing. when you guys mentioned, like, would you want to see if there was maybe a way you guys would be able to tie this movie into a true crime? I learned that when you cover a horror movie... You have like a plethora of real <laughs> obvious <laughs> options of like real life crime stories. Because I sent Vanya, I was like, which of these five vampire killers in real life should I mention on the podcast? I picked the grossest Definitely one. I picked the grossest one. Ooh, ooh, what is that? Oh, Richard Chase, you know, yeah. the vampire of Sacramento. What can you give Serial me? Serial killer. Yeah, ooh. you want to hear about him? I got some info. Tell just, us just in case. Yeah. All right. So, the Vampire of Sacramento terrified, uh, sorry, terrified and terrorized Californians in the late 1970s by not only killing his victims, but then drinking their blood. So Richard, the vampire, had a very troubled childhood and at the age of 25 was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. And he was institutionalized in 1975 to prevent him from becoming a danger to himself. Now, his fascination with blood earned him the nickname Dracula, among the psychiatric hospital assistants who witnessed him kill an attempt to drink the blood of several birds, which is a straight up scene from this movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, oh, sorry. So he tried to drink the blood of several birds in an effort to stave off the effects of a poison that he imagined was slowly turning his blood into powder. Uh, and then it was actually his attempt that to inject himself with rabbit's blood, which made him violently ill, that led to his institution. So like... He basically put rabbit blood in his own body to stop it from turning to powder, and that's when he was institutionalized. Ooh. So in spite of several similar incidents, uh, the staff thought that they'd rehabilitated him. So they uh, let him leave and go live with his mama. Uh, but there was technically no legally binding thing that said he had to stay with his mother. So not long after he was released from the hospital, he moved into an apartment that he shared with a group of young men that he called his friends— but I guess these uh, guys didn't know Richard all that well. And when he persisted in unusual behavior, they asked him to leave. But he refused, so they left and left him alone in the apartment. I just feel like there's so many Peter yeah. Lowe things here. So his fascination with blood resurfaced, and he began capturing and killing small animals. He <sighs> would eat them raw or blend their organs with soda and a oh mixture. Mm-hmm. In December of 1979, oh. Richard began his month-long killing spree, murdering six people, then drinking their blood, and in some certain specific cases, cannibalizing their organs. <laughs> yeah, police caught Richard at the end of January 1978, so he was charged, went to trial, pled insanity, but was ultimately found guilty of all six murders and sentenced to death. And then in interviews conducted by the late Robert Ressler, so Robert Ressler is an FBI agent and profiler who is, um, he's credited with like creating the term serial killer. Uh, so he actually did interviews with him. So Richard Chase's rationale for the killings ultimately boiled down to an irrational fear of soap dishes, Nazis, and UFOs. In these interviews, Richard spoke of his alleged Jewish heritage, which he did not have, and how he had been persecuted by Nazi UFOs who telepathically ordered him to kill others, lest his blood be turned to powder. And here's how he would know. He believed that if the soap dish was dry on the bottom, that he was safe. But if it had a more gelatinous texture, he was doomed to a slow death via a kind of, again, blood powder disintegration. And so he had to listen to the voices in his head to feed on, like to drink blood in order to... Keep his blood a uh, liquid form. But I just thought just like the delusions in this mm -hmm. story. Totally. Obviously, this is real 
And it's crazy that it's, you know, that's, this is crazy. This is, you know, an unbelievably strange, horrifying story. But just the the character, it makes me wonder, obviously, he had already been, you know, arrested, sent to jail. He committed suicide in prison. So they never actually put him to death. But, you know, he was like public knowledge at the time oh, this yeah. movie would have been made as well. So it's interesting to think potentially some of the ways they showed him like falling deeper into his delusion. Nick Cage, I'm referring to Nick Cage when I say him there. Peter uh, Lowe. Peter Lowe <laughs> was maybe, you know, in certain ways, like inspired by some of the bizarreness of of Richard Chase's delusions. So that's how I would have tied in true crime to Vampire's <laughs> Kiss. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> and um, I love to think um, that... Uh, Vanya, your pitch for how to make it a uh, rom-com would combine perfectly with the details of that story you just told. Right, yeah. Um, so of like, <laughs> yeah, great. Because I, I, lo- I loved, yeah, I love both of those. And I think that's a great pitch too for how to remake this in today's day and age. And it's so funny too, hearing that it, I get, it reminds me of sort of where the appeal is from true crime of the truth is stranger than fiction quote. Like, I feel like if you had those details of the the powderized blood fear and Nazi UFOs right. specifically. In, and you're like talking to you through your soap dish. Yeah, right. Like if you put that in a vampire's kiss, it would be almost too alienating in a way or, you know, disengage <laughs> audiences. Just like, what? <laughs> There's no way. Like it's just always that fascinating thing of how to make something more realistic. You're technically a lot of the times making it less realistic and more movie-like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cool. Truth but. is indeed stranger than fiction <laughs> a lot of the time. Cool. All right. Well, we like to wind down further here with some quick recommendations. Anything you've been watching, reading, uh, anything at all you'd just like to share with people and give a shout out to? Uh, how about in uh, first name alphabetical order, Avrin? All right. I got two. I just watched the new Nicolas Cage movie where he plays himself, like the the unimaginable weight of or heavy weight of oh, talent. I can't yeah. remember. And it's delightfully Nicolas Cage. And so check that out because Nicolas Cage, Nicolas Cage, Nicolas Cage, if you take anything away from this episode of Dismembering Horror. I also just started this new show on Hulu called The Bear about um, a guy who comes home to take over his brother's like Italian beef, like little restaurant in Chicago. Uh, But he's like a James Beard winning chef from New York. And he's trying to like figure out how to work in the different. I don't know. It was very compelling. There are three little half hour episodes. I've I've just I felt very invested almost immediately. So I recommend The Bear on Hulu. I've been seeing a lot of promos for that. That's good yeah. to know that it's worth checking yeah. out. Sticking first name alphabetical order. I'd be next here, I believe. Uh I will recommend Dead, the new Beavis and Butthead film. <laughs> Beavis and oh! Butthead do the universe. Not enough people know it exists. It exists on Amazon Prime. I needed a good laugh and it provided that. Do check it out, everyone. Oh, I will totally check that oh, out. Thank I had no idea you. that was a thing. Yeah. It's a worthy successor. Uh and then T, Tim. I have been watching a show. Uh, there is a drag queen that some people know of and some people don't, named Trixie Mattel, who is has many many shows and and podcasts and products and performances. Sh- she is quite something. Um, she's also from the same basic area as my girlfriend in in Milwaukee, and um, they have a show I- on Discovery. Plus, I believe it is, which is a weird another channel that we all now need to subscribe to. Um, but it's called the Trixie Motel. She and her partner, David, bought a motel in Palm Springs and are renovating it. And it's I mean, it's everything you want from a Trixie Motel show. It's awesome if you like home improvement stuff and drag queens and uh, queerness. Get into it. It's so good. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm so excited. I'm dying. (laughs) I actually went to Palm Springs a month ago and my friend and I took pictures in front of the, because the the episodes weren't out, but we sort of stalked the play, the motel. (laughs) We took pictures. It's really cute outside. It's like all pink. And I love all those three things so much, Tim. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And to wrap up our recommendations. Okay. 
Um, so I am obsessed with, and if you haven't started watching this, I'm I'm hoping that you guys have. But what we do in the, what we do in the shadows oh, is coming out with its best. next season. It's mm. starting. It's so good. July twelfth. I am so excited for this next season. And while I was waiting, I was just kind of like browsing, and the one of the guys, his name's like Ben. Oh my god, I'm not gonna get it right. But anyways, he was also in a TV show, like a series, like a limited run in 2004. And so I rewatched. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. It is one. T- <laughs> I it, it makes me so joyful. I still laugh. I watched an episode before this because I was excited and a little nervous, so I needed to like kind of relax, and I just giggled through it. It's ridiculous. It's the best, and it's available on Peacock if you have an- yet another streaming service. But they're all free. All <laughs> right. the episodes are free there. Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Have you not? Have you not? I've no. heard of it, but I've, I've not, not watched it. it. <laughs> I've never heard of it. I wrote it oh down. Oh my though. god, you guys. You great. need to please. Oh my god, it's about a horror writer. Oh great. I, I, you oh. I a horror I'm, writer? A, a horror, horror writer. Not a horror writer. Oh. A horror writer. A horror writer. Horror. Ha- which the vampire horror. is it? From What's that? The, what we do in the sh- Which vampire is it from what we it's, do in the shadows? Um, Laszlo. Okay. Oh, he's wow. in it, but he's not even the main guy. He plays uh one of the doctors. It's like oh, I I I I, I can't tell you enough go go watch this it's really good great that's that's awesome. exactly why we do this section <laughs> amazing great. all right well then that is it for episode 182 of dismembering horror avrin and vanya both of you thank you so so much for being here this was really great having two guests and that the two guests were you too thank you thank you for having us oh my God, so much fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and perfect fun film worked out to be great. Any last things about your show you want to share? Or We've got some good ones coming up. Yeah, great. We're up. New episodes out every Tuesday. We got some really, really fun mashups of rom-coms and true crimes coming up in a couple weeks. Yeah. Great. Please check it out, everyone. Uh, but until then, in closing, A, B, C, D. No, I won't do the whole thing. <laughs> Thanks for listening. That's right. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Good. Good. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>